Good evening. It's a real pleasure to welcome you this evening to uh, yet another wonderful omnibus series lecture. I hope you've all had a great 2013 so far, and this, as you know, is our first lecture in 2013, but it's actually the fourth lecture, lecture of the 2012-13 omnibus lecture season, one that is sure to be informative and enlightening. Since we only have two more lectures this season, it's not too early to start thinking about next season, which we are doing and planning for um, the next lecture series. To be more environmentally friendly and cost effective, we are no longer going to be sending omnibus postcards through the US mail beginning this September. Um, we very much want to keep you apprised of um, the series and our speakers, and we are going to do this electronically uh, starting in September. So we would ask you to please provide us with your email address or addresses where you would like information to be sent. And there's an insert in your program this evening. So if you would complete that and hand it to one of the uh, ushers before you leave, we'll make sure to get your email addresses so that we can communicate with you beginning in, in fall. Let me thank the sponsors of the IPFW Omnibus Lecture Series. Sincere thanks also to the founding sponsor of Omnibus, the English Bonter Mitchell Foundation, which has funded the series since 1995, and through their generosity, enabled all of these lectures to be offered free of charge to our campus and external communities. With their loyal support, IPFW has been able to host more than 100 nationally recognized speakers. Indeed. We deeply appreciate the 2012-13 Omnibus Media sponsors, Wayne TV and Northeast Indiana Public Radio, who have supported the series for many years, helping to publish these outstanding lectures. I was honored to meet Naomi Tutu earlier this evening, and I know we will all be touched by this long-time human rights activist message, hard conversations talking about race and racism. Ms. Tutu's stories of growing up black and female in apartheid South Africa and her message about how human dignity for all strengthens the whole human family will stay with you long after this evening. This is an especially relevant topic as we consider so many reports of oppression from around the world that continue today. I know that all, you, all of you are, as I am, eager to hear about the challenges and opportunities Ms. Tutu experienced as the daughter of her well-known Nobel laureate and human rights activist father, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who spoke here at IPFW some 10 years ago to over 2,200 people in the Gates Center. Now let me share with you the program format, format for this evening. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. There is one microphone stand on the lower level and one on the second level, where you can line up to ask your question rather than shout it from your seat. Please try to phrase your question succinctly to allow time for as many audience mem audience members as possible to participate in the questioning period. And finally, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Janet Badia, who will introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Janet is an IPFW assistant professor and director of women's studies. She received her PhD from the Ohio State University and began her career at Marshall University teaching multicultural American literature. Dr. Badia has been at IPFW since 2009 and teaches courses on feminist theory, girl culture, women's self-portraiture, and coming this fall, Sylvia Plath. In 2011, she published a book entitled Sylvia Plath and the Mythology of Women Readers. Please welcome Dr. Badia.
Welcome and good evening. As Chancellor Carwine mentioned, I direct the Women's Studies program here at IPFW, which has been offering courses about the diversity of women's lives, experiences, and contributions to society since 1972. One element of our program in Women's Studies that sets it apart from other disciplines and departments on campus is our interest in what we call intersectionality. That is, an approach to study and research whose focus is on the intersections of gender, race, ethnicity, class, and sexuality, particularly as they collude within systems of oppression and privilege. As many women's studies scholars have noted, intersectionality as a complex critical practice is essential to understanding and solving the social, cultural, and economic problems that breed inequality and injustice. Naomi Tutu's work as, as a human rights educator and activist very much embodies this ideal. As you look across her career, you see not simply someone committed to righting the injustices of racism, gender discrimination, and economic oppression, but a person who recognizes the complexities of the problems she hopes to resolve or eradicate. From her consulting work with the Spiritual Alliance to Stop Intimate Violence, to her efforts in South Africa to create educational and protect professional opportunities for black women, to her coordination of programs like the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town and the Race Relations Institute at Fisk University, Ms. Tutu's work serves as a model for how to advance our understanding of human rights and bring about meaningful, lasting change. It is indeed an honor to welcome her to IPFW. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. It, it is really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here this evening as, as part of this series. Um, when I was told about the series, I was told that there had been a hundred um, presentations already. So I was really excited because I thought I was going to be 101, you know, and then to find out that there have already been more than 100. So I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> but I guess I'll live. It, it is really, for me, uh, part of my life to be talking about issues of race and racism. Earlier today, I, I met with a class in sociology, a race and ethnicity class, and I told them that, you know, I think that each of us identifies areas in human rights that we feel passionate about and that we work towards in the bigger picture of making our world a just world, that we each find that niche that, that speaks most to us and that I had to tell them that my niche, actually, when you think about it, is actually a very selfish one, because as a black woman, to be a race and gender activist is really like, really? You couldn't look for anything else that you could do? Um, but it, it is uh, something that I, am, I have been passionate about since growing up in apartheid South Africa. And I have been especially interested in why it is so hard for us to have those difficult conversations about race and racism. Why is it that so often we shy away and we come up with nice ways of getting away from having those conversations, nice ways of avoiding those issues? And I, I like to tell people that there's not much that I am afraid of, but this evening I'm going to share with you some of the places that I have the greatest fear, some of the things that frighten me the most. And the first for me is, in fact, people who say that, you know, I don't notice difference. 
All I see are human beings. I don't see race. Now those people are almost top of my list of scary. They haven't quite got to, to the top, of, but they're almost top of my list. Because to me, when we say that we are combating racism, when we say we want to bring an end to racism, it is not about pretending that race does not exist. It is not about pretending that we don't notice the differences in our communities. It is not about trying to say to ourselves and to others that there is nothing different about us. A few years ago, I uh, was started working with a, a, a woman who has become a, a very close friend of our families subsequently. But we, as we were starting to work, she's a white American and I'm a black South African, obviously, just in case you hadn't noticed. Um, and uh, as we were having our conversations about planning, working together, at one point I said to her, you know, so your experience, how is this affecting your experience and our work experience working with a black woman? And she said, oh, I don't think of you as black. Now, she says, I just about jumped down the, thro the phone and throttled her. I say, I counted to 10 and then very politely said, what do you mean you don't think of me as black? She's not here, I am, so you know who's telling the truth. <laughs> and, and from there we started a conversation about race and racism that became part of the work that we did together. And I challenged her about what did she think she was saying when she said to me she doesn't think of me as black. And I told her what I heard. And what I heard and what so many people of color hear when people make statements like, I don't think of you as black. And believe you me, most people of color have heard that statement from an employer, a friend, sometimes from very close people. And what, what, what I heard is for her to be able to accept me, to be able to be comfortable with me, she had to ignore, she had to choose to ignore my blackness. Because you know, there is no way that she looked at me and didn't recognize that I was black. Because I know it, you know, every morning I look in the mirror and I say, wow, that is a mighty fine black woman there. <laughs> Somebody has to say it to me, right? <laughs> um, but that, but, but that when, as, as we, we continue to speak, she said that part of it for her was the discomfort of raising the issue of race. That why would I raise the issue of race? And I explained to her that, you know, the issue of race is raised in my life almost constantly. And it doesn't help me and it doesn't help our community for us to try and veer away from, from that fact. The fact is race has been used to determine the opportunities of a huge part of our population. And so when somebody says they don't notice race, first of all, we have to, if we give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they're not lying, then we have to ask what is underlying their view that they have to pretend they don't see race? What is underlying, what is the fear of being in conversation about race that underlies that statement. And if it is not fear about the conversation, then it is in fact racism that underlies that very statement. Because if you were willing to accept me for who I am, 
for all of who I am, for all of what I bring, then there isn't a part of me that you would have to ignore or reject in order to be in relationship, in conversation, in, in work with me. So for me, those who say, I don't see race, I don't see difference, all I see are human beings, are scary. But even scarier than that for me are those who say, why can't we be like children? You know, children don't notice difference. And that scares me for on a number of levels. Well, first is, obviously you have not been around children. <laughs> because if there is anybody who notices difference, it is children. And if there is anybody who is quite comfortable with making it known to the world that they have noticed difference, it is children. And as any parent will tell you, they choose the most perfect times to make those announcements of noticing difference. And those times in the grocery store in a nice restaurant, why is that person browned? That's one I heard. I like that though, browned, you know? <laughs> why is she browned? One of, one of my experiences was sitting on a plane um, at a time when I had shaved all my hair off and having a young couple come onto the plane with a toddler. And as, as they walked past, he stopped and was like, why doesn't that woman have any hair? And you know, his parents are like, come on, Johnny. <laughs> And I could just imagine this poor child now was gonna go through the rest of his life terrified of bald women. And, and so I said, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. I said, you know, I don't have any hair because I just am too lazy to comb my hair, so I cut it all off. And I just saw his eyes light up. It's like, oh, wow, that's an option, you know? <laughs> really? <sighs> but it is scary to me because I think that they have part of the answer, in fact, when they say, why can't we be more like children? But then they spoil it. And the reality is, as I say, children notice difference. And they query difference. But for them, difference is an opportunity to learn something new about the world. It is an opportunity to expand their horizon. It is an opportunity to, to revel in th the differences that they see, to get to understand that the world is a huge place with so many different opportunities and languages and peoples and foods and ways of doing things, that these are all opportunities to expand their horizon. And for me, starting our conversations on race, I ask people, pretend you are a child, and start by asking the questions that you have been told you should not ask. The truth is, if we hold our conversations from the perspective of children, that this is an opportunity for me to learn something about another person, but also something about myself. That this is an opportunity to expand my horizon. That if I walk into conversations on race and racism saying, I want to learn and I want to be part of a solution, not part of a problem, we are already well on our way to holding those conversations. But it is not enough to say, I come into this wanting to learn. We have to also be willing to be those who admit our own prejudices. 
And so these are the people who top my scary list. It is those who say, I don't have a prejudiced bone in my body. Because I promise you, you cannot have lived in our society. You cannot have heard the messages about others and not have a prejudiced bone in your body. It might be just one, but I promise you it's there. And if we are going to hold our conversations, then we have to admit our biases. We have to admit the lessons that we have learned. We have to listen to the tapes that play in our heads when we meet different people. We have to stop ourselves and be willing to admit to our prejudices. A, a, a few years ago, I was asked, actually it's not a few years ago now, my goodness, it's 13 years ago, oh, time flies. But um, I was asked to speak at Vanderbilt University about the 21st century and issues of race and gender leading into the 21st century. And, um, and as I said, you know, these, my passion. So I, I was definitely, as they say, going to town on, and during this presentation, talking about how I believe the 21st century was going to be the century where people of color and women changed the whole way that we looked at one another, the whole way we looked at politics and economics, the whole way we looked at the way our society was structured, and that this was going to be an exciting time for us in, in the world. And as I said, I was, I was having a ball imagining all this glorious 21st century and challenges and opportunities that, that would come forth. And um, as soon as I'd finished my presentation, just as we're doing this evening, we had a time for question and answers. And I looked up, and the first person to stand up, I looked and I said, oh, Lord, angry white man, oh, jeez. Why, why me? Why would it have to be an angry white man, really? You know, I mean, the poor man had not even opened his mouth yet, but I knew who he was. And he stood up and he asked his question, and it turned out that he was an angry white man, but he was not the angry white man that I was expecting. He was not talking about um, the way that women and people of color are, are eroding the opportunities and, and place of white men. He was an angry white man. He was a young man who had spent much of his life on the streets as a homeless person, and he had spent um, other parts of his life in the, the Tennessee mental health system, and was angry because he said, you know, this place where you are holding this conversation is a privileged place. And it is not a place that has historically been welcoming to people of color or women. And, and so it is a strange place for you to be having this conversation. You know, the people who need to be empowered are not welcome, do not feel welcome in this space. And so we went back and forth with our conversation until the moderator finally said to him, Carl, he goes to everything they have there, so they even knew his name. It's like, Carl, can you sit down and give other people an opportunity to, to ask questions? And so um, he sat down and um, the next morning when I went to my office at Tennessee State University, he was standing outside my office and he had an envelope. He gave me this envelope and walked away. When I opened the envelope, it was, you know, I really enjoyed our conversation last night. I would really like to talk to you more about race and gender. And um, here's my phone number. Call me if, if you want to meet for coffee. So I called him and the next week we met for coffee and we talked for hours. And then the week after that, we met for coffee again and we talked for hours. And then a couple of weeks after that, we met for lunch and we talked for hours. And, um, and, and and then about three months later, he lost the place that he had been living and he came and moved in with me and my family for a little while. And um, <laughs> what can I say? And, and he has become 
for my son, especially Uncle Carl, who taught him chess, who, make, who remembers his birthdays, who challenges him uh, about his academic schoolwork, his, his academic work, and, and encourages him to be the best young man that he can possibly be. And I think about that tape that I heard when he first stood. And I think about what I would have lost in my life if I had allowed that tape to keep playing. And the, the, the reality is, is that if you don't admit that there is a tape, then you don't act, you're not actually conscious of it playing. And therefore, you are not conscious of it stopping you from reaching out and, and connecting with those people you know as other. So if you say, I don't have a prejudiced bone in my body, you've already stopped the conversation before it can even start. Because that means that those tapes are in fact so strong, you don't even notice them. And to be in conversation, we have to start at least from that place of recognizing that yes, I do have a prejudiced bone in my body. And yes, I have picked up messages of the other, lessons that I have learnt about the other. That there are tapes, messages, stories that I know about those I know as other. So we start the conversation. We start the conversation first by not saying, I don't notice difference. Oh, I have to tell you, one of my favorite stories about not, not noticing difference, sorry. I know I digress a little bit from conversations, but I, I was trying to think of a way of putting it in terms for, for people to understand what it means when you say, I don't notice difference, what it means to people who look different from you when you say, I don't notice difference. And I had this wonderful enlightening thing um, because I have a mother who is, obsessed with gardening. I mean, she is obsessed with gardening. When I lived in Cape Town, I would sometimes wake up and hear somebody in my garden. And it was my mother gardening in my yard because she said, you know, she was embarrassed that people would know that this was her daughter's house with a garden that looked like that. She didn't know that I left like that on purpose because I knew the longer I left it, eventually she would get there and clean it up, you know. Uh, but but I, I, I always say, I can just imagine if somebody walked into my mother's garden and said to her, oh, this is a nice garden. But you know, I don't notice different flowers. I don't notice roses. I, I don't know anything about flowers, so I know roses and not roses. So, you know, if somebody came in and said, I don't, you know, I don't see roses and not roses and those other not roses and those other not roses. I just see flowers. And I can just imagine my mother's reaction. We would probably be burying somebody the next day, you know, that she would be saying, I work so hard to make my garden this diverse, to have these different flowers blooming at different times with different colors, those that do well in the shade. See, I've hung around her enough to know that there are these things. That had, those that do well in the sun, those that need rain, those that don't need water, that I have worked for this difference in my garden. And for you not to notice is actually an insult. And so I think, you know, I just imagine that, you know, God standing up there and she's saying, what do you mean you don't notice difference? I work so hard to make people look differently, think, speak differently, eat different stuff. And so whenever somebody says that, I actually step aside because the lightning bolt is not going to get me, okay? <laughs> You're on your own with that one. So, but at least so that when we start, we cannot start the conversation without having said, okay, we have 
difference. We look different, we have different experiences. Okay, I know that I have these tapes, these stories of prejudice. I have that one prejudice bone in my body. Okay, I am coming in to this conversation saying I am ready to learn. I am ready to experience this as an opportunity to expand my horizons. So we're, we're at the threshold of that conversation. But then the next thing is that we have to recognize that it is a dangerous conversation. It is a dangerous conversation because our society has made issues of race dangerous. They have made it as though race is an all-defining issue in people's lives, that your race determines who you are. So when I say that I look and I see a, a, a black woman and, and I am proud to be a black woman and I am happy to be a black woman, but I am not happy with all the experiences that come with being a black woman. I am not happy with having to ask store detectives over and over why do you think you need to follow me? What is it about me that looks that suspicious? I am tired of having to challenge teachers and community leaders about my children and who they are and how well they can achieve and how well or badly they behave and, and, and knowing that the story that they have about my son or my daughter is largely a part of the story that they have of black youth. So I say that these conversations are dangerous because in these conversations, we have to be prepared to deal with the hurt, with the anger, with the tiredness, with the guilt. We have to be prepared to have ourselves challenged. We have to be prepared to hear someone say, when you say you don't think of me as black, I hear that you don't see me. We have to be prepared to share the stories that we have been told and have learned about one another. When I was um, working at the, the University of Cape Town, I was approached by um, a psychology professor um, to be part of a program that, were, that, that she was leading in, in, uh, in, in, in Cape Town around um, issues between African and colored um, activists in the Western Cape. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, before I start the story, okay? So in South Africa, under apartheid, we had four general racial classifications. Because I don't want somebody to say to me, colored, people still using colored in South Africa? So I have to explain, okay? So we had white, which is more or less self-explanatory. Though I always say it's amazing to me that white encompassed English, Afrikaans, Portuguese, French, that all of a sudden they were all the same thing, okay? But okay, I digress. Um, and then we had Asian, which in South Africa meant people from the Indian subcontinent because um, uh, Japanese in South Africa were actually honorary white uh, because South Africa had an important trading partnership with Japan. Don't laugh, you know who else was honorary white under apartheid? African Americans. 
I always tell her, I said, you know, you missed your chance to know what it feels like to be white. You should have come to South Africa under apartheid. <laughs> Sorry, too late now. Uh, moving right along. And then we had African, and then colored, which is people of mixed ancestry. And the mixed ancestry is important because under apartheid, interracial dating and interracial marriage were illegal. And so there should not have been mixed race people, you know? <laughs> but um, and the ancestry is because, you know, when the first Europeans came, um, they were mostly sailors. And my understanding is that in those olden days, most of the sailors were men. And so then they came and they made friends with the Africans. And the, so we have a mixed race population, okay? Um, and then, um, and, and African. So there were the, the, the four of us, the four, four, four racial classifications. And interestingly enough, um, you could actually um, apply to have your racial classification changed. And, and, and this is a, a, an important part of the story, particularly for the Western Cape. So twice a year, the government would publish, you know, 16 whites are now colored, 200 colors are now white, Six Asians are now colored, 10 coloreds are now Asian, 400 Africans are now colored, and we couldn't make it to white for some reason. I don't know what, you know. Um, and, 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 and the Western Cape, you know, where Cape Town is, was under apartheid, a, a colored preferential area. So the structure was white, colored, Asian, depending on what province you were in, and then African. Um, but the Western Cape was a place where coloreds were, were even more than in the rest of the country were, were privileged under, un, under apartheid, in, privileged in their oppression. So the oppression was definitely there, but it was you know, slightly privileged. And, 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 and what that meant, what that came to mean, particularly in the Western Cape, was um, a, a, a tension between African and colored um, because of this, this preferential, the, the way that it was so highlighted in the Western Cape. And we found ourselves at the end of apartheid that the Western Cape was in fact the, the only province in South Africa that brought into the provincial government, that put the provincial government in the hands of of the Nationalist Party, the party that was the party of apartheid. Um, and so, the, so because of people were, were concerned about this, and, um, and so Cheryl asked me to, to be part of a, a project that was going to challenge and, 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 and try and have the conversation about this tension. And initially, I, I, I was reticent because I had just arrived in the Western Cape and it was a very, really, it was a very different experience for me. Um, and, 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 but she said, you know, that actually, that's good. You're, you're going to bring in a, 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 good, a new perspective, a, a, fresh, a fresh eye, if you like. And I, I, I always tell people at this point that it shows what a good person I am that we are still friends after that request that she made of me because she made it sound like it was going to be some easy little academic conversations that we were going to have about Africanis, Africanism and coloredism, for want of better terms. And then when we met, she says to us, um, you know what? What I would like us to do is not to have an academic conversation. I would like us to have a conversation about what we know about ourselves and what we know about the other. So as Africans, what do you know about being African? And as coloreds, what do you know about being coloreds? And then what do you know about each other? And so we started the process by going away into our African and colored groups and having these conversations and then coming back and sharing what we, what we had learned. And there were a couple of interesting things. So, so first of all, the, you know, when we met as, as the African, um, whatever we're called, and had the conversations about what did we know about being African, there was this kind of split personality thing going on. So on the one hand, we were proud 
because we were the original people of South Africa. So there was that sense of being an African was about being the original people of South Africa. And in fact, in our languages, that the word for human being is the same word as for African. So, you know, when somebody says, how many people were at the lecture, we'd say, well, there were 70 people and then 10 whites and four. So, so we are the people. The rest of you are just visiting, really. Uh, <laughs> And so there was that sense of, of, of the pride of being the original people. But then we had also learned the experience of apartheid and had internalized that racism. And, and that, that came out in, in, in many different ways, but the way that we highlighted in our conversation was that uh, uh, you know, our, our weddings go on for days. And, and part of the wedding is that the, the wedding party goes and dances and sings in the street. And, but that the, the first song when I was growing up, the song that used to be sung when the bride came out from the fir for the first time, was going to be seen by people for the first time, was come out and see our beautiful bride. She looks like a colored. So for an African girl to be pretty, she looked like a colored. So obviously our, our sense of ourselves had been affected by the apartheid system. So that was the first interesting thing was that split idea that we had of ourselves. But the second interesting thing was once we came back and shared with one another what we knew about each other. And we knew exactly the same things about one another. So Africans knew that coloreds were lazy, coloreds knew that Africans were lazy. Africans knew that coloreds were drunks, coloreds knew that Africans were drunks. Africans knew that coloreds did not value education. Coloreds knew that Africans did not value education. So we had these tapes playing in our head about the other. And how we had learned these messages was also a, a, an, op an eye opening because when we started talking about how do we come to this realization to what we know about the other, we all had stories that it wasn't about, you know, somebody sat you down and say, listen, colors are do, 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 or listen, Africans do this and this and this. I, I for example, remembered growing up, I lived with my grandparents um, for, for, for some years with my, my grandparents and, and some aunts and cousins. And I can remember as a young child, you know, having eaten and then just left my plate wherever it was to run out and play with my friends and to have one of my aunts come to the gate and say, what, are you colored now? You can't clean up after yourself? So, oh, coloreds don't clean up after themselves, okay. And so the tapes start playing. And, and so, as we come into our conversations, it is about unpacking all of those things and being willing to say to one another, this is the story that I have heard. Now we're not saying this is the story I have heard and this is the story that I know is true about you. But it is necessary that at least we are clear with one another about what it is we know about one another. Because unless and until we are willing to share what we know, there is no way to unlearn and allow that to be challenged. So our conversation is a dangerous one because we are going to have to share the truths that we have come to accept about one another and in that way to be challenged. And the conversations are dangerous because they challenge the most fundamental divisions we have put up between each other. They make us go beyond our differences. 
they make us recognize that our differences are a part of who we are, but fundamentally, fundamentally, we are human beings who share in real ways fears, dreams, hopes, that we share fears about not being the full person that we think we can be. We share dreams of opportunities for ourselves and for our children. That if our conversations are not merely a chance to talk, but are really about challenging racism, then their aim is not simply to bring up all the differences and stories and tapes. Their aim is to bring us down to that level of recognizing and celebrating the gloriousness of our shared humanity. And that is scary. That is scary to us because in doing that, we have to be willing to let go. Let go of our views of ourselves and others, to let go of our knowledge of the way things are meant to be, to let go of the idea that there is something inherently superior or inferior about a particular race or ethnicity. And no matter what we say, it means that we have to let go of a world view that we have come to in some way, shape, or form. And for all our wonderfulness, there may be nothing as hard as giving up the certainty of knowing what we know. Whether it is knowing what we know about ourselves or knowing what we know about the other. And yet, the truth is, is that that very thing that is so scary is also the place that gives us the greatest opportunity for a truly wonderful society. When we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings in South Africa, and I would listen to those who were coming to apply for amnesty and hear for the kinds of torture that they came up with to use against um, the opponents of the government. I, I, at one point, I sat there and I, and I said, you know, I wonder where South Africa would be today if we had taken, because some of the things these people came up with were so out of this world that you had to think, this, whoever thought this up, I mean, what, what were they doing? But that there had to be an amazing mind to come up with that level of degradation. And I wondered, what if we as a country had asked those people to come up with ways to heal our country, had come uh, to come up with ways of making our country serve all its people. I wonder where we would be as a country today. And I have that same sense when I think about racism. I, because 
as I said, I know how tired I get of arming myself for the battles against racism, the daily pinpricks, the daily put downs. I know how much energy I expend in protecting myself and my children from the impact of racism. And I have to ask myself, where would we be as a community, as a country, as a world, if people did not have to spend energy protecting their very humanity, defending their very humanity simply because of their race? So that thing that is actually so scary is, in fact, our great opportunity. It is the thing that, for me, pushes me to continue these conversations. Because can you imagine, can you imagine what our world would be if people of color didn't have to keep worrying about those small things, like being followed by store detectives, like being stopped by the police for no apparent reason. Those experiences of racism, that can you imagine the energy that we would have at our disposal if we did not spend our time trying to close ourselves off from one another, but rather offered each other the opportunity to give of our very best all the time in every situation to give our energy for healing, for original thinking, for creativity. That is why I ask you to have the courage to be part of these most difficult conversations. Because these most difficult conversations offer us the most glorious opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I see the one mic is there, and the other mic is. is it, where is the other mic? Okay, I see that one. Oh, there. Okay. Okay, so. Not all at once, people. Okay? <laughs> Please. It's an honor to speak to you this evening. I have two quick questions. The first question is, what do you think about the vision of the USA, United States of Africa? And the second question, who would you recommend to uh, read in terms of scholars dealing with the concept of racism and white supremacy, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of educating us about how to, you know, tackle that issue? Mm. Okay. So um, the, the first one first, you know, um, I, I, I'm somebody who's always dreamed of a United States of Africa. I've always believed that, um, that Africa's 
wealth and, and, and um, natural resources and, and human capital will never be fully realized in the, 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 the fractured continent that we are. Um, I mean, for a number of reasons. First of all, that, that most of our borders still don't make sense. Um, and, and so to, to, to define ourselves based on, on those borders is part of the reason that we are constantly seeing conflicts um, on, on the continent. So, uh, you know, if we were to say, look at a, an opportunity of a, a federal Africa, with, with local government that makes sense for people in terms of their, their ethnic and, and, and political affiliations, that that would make more sense than the, the, the nation states that, I, that we have right now. Do I think that that's a possibility? I, you know, I don't know. Um, because there are people obviously with vested interest in the nation states that exist, you know. So if you are now the president of, of somewhere to be told that, you know, in 10 years you're not going to be the president and you might not even be anything in government of the, of, of the African continent, then you might not be really gung-ho on being part of that process. And, and I think that, that that's what we've seen over and over, even with, you know, when, with the, the Pan-African movement um, in the 60s, that, that as people moved to independence, the, I, we thought that it was a move to a United States of Africa, but once people experience the, the honors and, and privileges of, of, of being heads of state and government officials, that it wasn't as um, interesting to be part of a, an African federal system. And so I, I continue to dream, and I know that, the, that 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 conversation is one that continues in different areas uh, of of the continent. Um, in terms of scholars to read, you know, I I don't even know because I I'll tell you why I say that because I have I have read books that have really excited me by, by different people and, and then have talked to people who I am working with who I greatly respect and they read the same book and they're like, eh, really? That did that for you? And, and, I, but, and, and I think that partly the thing about books is that they are very personal things and, and how a, a book impacts you is going to be very different from, from how it, it, it impacts others. So, um, you know, so f for instance, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll st I'll, I will go ahead and say a couple of things, though, a couple of people that I've, 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 I've been reading um, and, and with that caveat, okay? So um, Neely Fuller, um, who has done a, a lot of work around, um, around blackness and, and African power in, in general, um, I, is, is somebody whose, whose work I've, I've found intrigues me and, and, and makes me ask questions of myself. Um, the one that is not specifically a, around Specific, I mean, not race and racism conversations, but you know, a, a recent book, Michelle Alexander's book on 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 the prison was has I've used as a conversation starter um, around issues of race and racism, even though you know it's focused on a specific aspect of, of society. Um, a, a, another one that that I have used, and I and I and I and I have to say again up front that. I'm in the book is um, uh, by by Raymond Winbush the, the 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 collection on reparations. So having the conversation for me, part of the conversation has to be the conversation around slavery and reparations in this country. And so so yeah, I hope that you'll take the caveat first, right? And then if you want to look at any of those, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Kevin Jelm. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, my question is just to basically describe your job being a development consultant in West Africa. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, that was uh, my first job out of, um, out of graduate school. And my mother insists that it's been downhill ever since. That, that was the best job that I ever had. And um, so the, I, I actually worked for an organization called Equator Advisory um, Company. And it was, was an interesting organization in that it was based in Hartford, Connecticut, but it did all its work in sub-Saharan Africa. And I worked as a, as a team economist um, on projects in Ghana, Nigeria, and uh, Guinea Conakry. Um, so it was so it was in the the 80s, and Guinea Conakry had was which was where I did a lot of my work had just come out of um, the the military dictatorship and was opening up um, opportunities now for um, investment and um, an economic trade. And, and so I, I was working most, in, in Guinea I was working mostly at simply looking at opportunities for, for trade and investment. In, in Ghana I, w I worked around issues of forestry and um, uh, yeah, and which is part of the reason that I left that field. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, and in Nigeria was doing mostly work around economic um, education, um, particularly around um, market women who really didn't need economic education. They were doing much better economically than I could ever do, but um, just in, in terms of more structured um, work with them. Yep. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> As a black male in the United States, I, um, I get so offended um, when I relate my story to people and um, there's this constant denial of facts that are, you know, mm -hmm. You, 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 the facts that are there that um, you're sure that people can see, mm -hmm. and there's this denial. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier the Truth and Reconciliation um, Committee. Mm -hmm. What impact do you think that had on the psyche of the whites who were present as well as those who had been marginalized? Mm -hmm. So um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, again, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was South Africa's um, move from apartheid into a, a democratic society, and it was an attempt to uh, to bring forward the stories of, 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 of torture, human rights abuses, um, human rights violations that happened um, during apartheid and to, to heal, to start the process of healing and reconciliation for, for the country. And what it entailed was that those who um, were perpetrators of human rights abuses um, were encouraged to apply for amnesty for, for their acts. And, you know, I mean, I, I think for me the most striking thing in listening to white South Africans um, around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was how many times I heard white South Africans say, I didn't know that, that this was going on. And, um, and, and it, was, it was really a struggle for me because, you know, people had been saying, this is going on. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, uh, and, and I think that, the, and, and I think that's part of the reason for my, my passion about this is that, you know, if, if you don't acknowledge the tapes that you have in your head, then you, you don't acknowledge what you refuse to hear or, or what you cannot hear. So for many white South Africans, um, you know, the tapes that had been played had been that those who are opposed to apartheid are communist terrorists trying to destroy the country so that there is nothing that they say that can have any validity. And so it, you know, it didn't matter um, what, what somebody, for instance, like my father was saying because he had been identified as enemy. And so everything that he said was, must have been from a place of trying to destroy South Africa. So, um, and, 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 and so 
I think that what it what it did do was to to make white South Africans acknowledge what had been done in their names, um, even those even if they had not participated in you know actively participated as torturers or or as police or military um, in, in 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 townships or in you know in in or in government. And I, and I think, though, you know, it, it, it is still a limit. It, it was still a limited response because I, you know, I think that our natural response as as human beings is to make to make my guilt as minimal as possible. So I didn't know. I was not an actual torturer. I was not one of the police who killed people. So I didn't know. And, it, and even as people said, you know, we apologize, not many, but some said we apologize for what was done in our name under apartheid, still the, the attempt to distance themselves from the actual imposition of apartheid. Good evening. Um, my name's Taylor, and I was wondering what steps do you think IPFW students can take to continue to break down the ideas of racism here on campus? Okay. So, well, you can start having conversations about, <laughs> see, I gave you those little steps, right? So you can start having those conversations in classes, in clubs, in your dorms. Um, and, and I think that, you know, as individuals, we can start the process as individuals. And part of the reason that I, I shared the story about Carl is that it, it, sometimes it is something as simple as, may, as hearing what you are saying. Hearing what you are saying in your mind about somebody or a situation. And, you know, I say it's as simple as that, but we're so used to hearing our voices about people that we sometimes don't even notice the voice. And, and, and so, for me, part of being in this process is practicing the discipline of hearing yourself and seeing yourself, seeing how you react to different people in different situations and asking yourself, what made me do that? Or what, what made me say that? Or what was, what was I thinking as I, as I went into this situation? So in, in, for me, um, you know, challenging racism starts with making the, the choice as an individual to listen to, to those messages and voices that we are often unconscious of and then be in conversation with those around us about how do we go beyond challenging the voices in our heads to challenging the structures in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, nobody there, so we'll go back there. Hi, my name's Rebecca, and I wanted to thank you for coming. Thank you. My, qu my question was, in your story about Carl, you talked about how you were so excited for the 21st century and how much progress could be made, and I wanted to know your thoughts on how that's going. <laughs> Are, are we doing a good job? Good question. <laughs> you know, I think like most things in life, it's a both and. So I think that we, we have made, we have made uh, amazing strides. I mean, the, the fact that, um, that uh, our, in the democratic primaries, not these ones because we didn't have democratic primaries this time, but the last time that we had an African-American man and a woman um, is, is to me part of that statement that, that we are moving um, as, as, a, as a society in terms of what our, our perceptions are of people based on race and gender and what people are capable of based on race and gender. And, 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 I, and I see it, um, you know, as working with young people across the country with different organizations that, um, that, that 
the challenges to sexism and the challenges to racism, I, I see more often um, amongst young people. And then having said that though, I have to also say that I also am very aware that what we are also experiencing at the same time as I think we're experiencing this exciting move, we are experiencing an amazing backlash to that move. Um, and that we and that way we see it. I mean, in in going back to um, President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton, we see it in the way that they were portrayed by by much of the media in in, in and 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 and, and in, in, in 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 conversations during that time. That you know, uh, I I can remember. Being in a actually it wasn't the media, but I was in a in a in a in an airport lounge, and and um, Secretary of State she wasn't then came on and was saying something, and 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 um, the commentator said something about you know a woman running for president, and a group of men in the lounge. Somebody said, "Well, she's not really a woman anyway." And I was like, oh my God, I mean that you would say that in public, you know, um, and, 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 to, and, and that the response from the people around him was, hey, hey, hey. Mm, okay, um, the, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> but, um, and, and, you know, and, and the talk about President Obama as a, with no birth certificate, jeez, if I hear about a birth certificate one more time, um, you know, the, being a Muslim, Kenyan, oh, you know, so that, use, I mean, and, and those two are people who actually can protect themselves, who can speak up for themselves, who can defend themselves. But, that, but, but I think that that is, um, um, a symptom of what we are experiencing in 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 our in society as a whole challenges now to to women's access what you know I, I i could not believe that we were back uh, i think it was last year questioning a young woman who had been raped about what was she doing where she was that you know we, I thought that we had moved beyond those conversations, and yet when we look at what the conversations are right now around women's access to reprodu reproductive health care, is it's like we step back into not even the 19th century, like the 16th century, you know. So it's it, it really is a both and in in, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, so there is somebody here now. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I really, you are a really inspiring person. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I have two questions. Um, well, I'm in a sophomore in high school, and um, I've, I've, I've had experiences of racism, and I'm obviously Asian, not black. Mm -hmm. And, um, sorry. Well, um, I was just wondering, like, I, I do have friends that make racist comments and you know, they expect me to forgive them and they'll be like, oh, I'm just kidding. And you know, I was just wondering what is your thoughts about that? And I also was wondering, where do you find the people that don't have that critical racist thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the, the racist jokes and, and, and comments. Um, and, and, and again, this is, what I, this is one of the things that I, I was trying to reference when I talked about people of color being tired, that you know, it is tiring to bring people's attention to what they have said and to let them know that this is not just rude and hurtful, but it is in fact a, a, a part of a system of oppression. And, um, a, and yet, what I, I say to, to my, my children is, unfortunately, if we are going to change the world, you have the responsibility to consistently challenge people when they make comments that are racist to you. And, and it's not fair. It is not fair. Um, because you know you are bearing the brunt of 
of, of racism and then you are given the responsibility of challenging racism. Uh, but there, there is no way that we are going to change our society until and unless each person challenges when, whenever they hear it whenever they see it and whether it's, it's directed at you or at someone else. And I, and I know how, I, I, I can imagine how, how tiring it must be. And you don't want to have your friends mad at you for being the, the goody goody who's forever challenging them about um, statements that they make. Um, and yet, I hope that you, 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 you find the energy and courage to, to continue to do that. And, you know, and to say to them, yeah, I'm willing to forgive you, but the, I cannot keep forgiving you for the same thing over and over, you know? I, we're human, we make mistakes, but, we, but I can't keep dealing with you making the same mistakes over and over. Now I started preaching and so I forgot your second question, sorry dear. I got, yes, can you tell me okay. the second part? Because I, well, I said like, where do you find the people? Like, no, where do I find, oh, where yeah. do you find? You know what, you find them everywhere. And you find them sometimes in people who have been the, the most racist, the, who, who come to the realization that they have been the most racist. I, I, as I say, I, you're not going to, I don't think that you're gonna find people without a prejudice bone in their body. And if you do run because they're lying to you, okay? But, but that there are, but that it, there are in our community, in the community, if you can find people willing to be in the conversation with you about race and racism, those are the people who are the ones who will, are going to make a change. Thank you. Hi, I'm Helen, and I have more of a confession than a question. I'm one of those uh, second-tier people that you're fearful of. <laughs> I have no idea how it was embedded in me, but I felt for years like I needed to look at everybody as if they were the same, and my guess is I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> more than a year ago, I finally accepted I can't do it. I can't look at somebody that's black and not realize they're black, because they <laughs> are, we're different. And so um, I thank you for that. Uh, it was an important lesson. You have freed my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I think, oh, was that the last question? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>